Um, I want to take a second here before I start just to, it's probably blurry back here uh, in small, but I just want to say that these books right here are all authors who have touched me in some way personally and been such a wonderful writing community. And I just so appreciate that. Um, also in uh, the boxes, little boxes tonight, there are a lot of writers who have been a part of my writing community and have great works in progress soon to be published. And just thank you, thank you. Thanks to my friends who are here. I see a bunch and family. I see a lot of family out there. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm gonna drop us in midway through the first chapter of Live Caught. Uh, I think the only context you really need is that Lenny is 14 year old who's run away from home and he's had a boating accident and is stuck under a partially collapsed dock. He's been there all night. Uh, he has a large piling that is holding him into the mud. And as the lake wakes up, uh, boats are going by and wakes are starting to come up over his head. He has dreamed his rescue twice and now a vagrant happens by. And Lenny is really hopeful that this is not just another dream. I think that'll be enough context. Uh, so here we go. And thanks for, for listening. A deep silence settles over the pilings, except for the gentle lapping of water. He goddamn dreamed up the green-eyed geezer, dreamed up another rescue, number three of the morning, a morning full of boats sprouting wakes that ran up his chest, big boats hemorrhaging water up and over his head, the mud swirling, water flooding up his nose, stopping up his ear, sheer choking terror, submerged panic that the dock pilings we shift hold him under forever. You couldn't just find your thought hole and dive into it. You had to stay alert. You had to tell yourself, mental yourself into believing it's not the ocean. It's not a goddamn rising tide. No, he can figure the timing, hold his breath between waves of terror, ignore the mud building up under his head, tell himself he's not wearing out. No, he's not wearing out, not choking, not gagging. He can shake cake mud from his nose, his eyes, his mouth, make a game of it. Estimate how many more wakes it will take for the backwash from the bank to start sliding over his hair, over his forehead, testing, testing whether the numbness in his legs, his arm, his stump has completed its work. Shit, would he know when he's dead? Lenny pushes hope back down into the muck like the rest of him, but it just won't go. It's too much like drowning your last friend or maybe like your enemy. Even if you could, even if the possibility sits right there at your fingertips, you just won't do it. Besides, could the old man possibly be a dream? If he's not dreaming, what a whacked out, unlucky way to die. Even for a kid who's been hung by the neck, who's been rolled off a freaking barn roof, resulting in half an arm being sawed off. And just as he was starting his first solo and therefore his best adventure. A long splintered plank drops into the muck beside Lenny. Anything broke, broke down in here? The old man's legs reappear, fishless, because wouldn't you hang your slimy catch right back in the water to keep it fresh, to keep it alive? The ridge-lined face drops low as the old man again squats below dock. Green dazzle eyes run from Lenny's head to his toes, then back. I say, Mr. Dip Dick, anything broke? Would Lenny call himself Mr. Dead Dick? Lenny gathers his strength because getting it over with was the one thing that three years without a lower right arm had taught him. You got to do it early because you just absolutely cannot take people by surprise with a thing like a stump. Getting over it, getting it over with is one of his only defenses against ignorant scorn. So he siphons in a deep breath and slowly, slowly, wheels his raw stump into a reverse suction out of the muck. The twisted seam of leathery healed up sutures hang in the air between him and the old man. 
In Lenny's experience, people generally had one of two ways when confronted with such an unsightly remnant, hell bent in the opposite direction, or, and this is what Lenny's hoping for, head over heels determined to help out a one-armed boy. Seemingly of its own accord, Lenny Stump drops back into the mud. The old man rocks back and splats on his butt. Sits there, peers at Lenny like he's just found him under the dock pines all over again. Then a raspy giggle escapes the geezer's throat. You, he says, you little fucker, you. Abruptly, his hands clap twice, then he sucks in a deep breath. I can see you got a joke or two left, you little pea head. Again, the hand clapping like his own live punctuation. Okay, okay, worries be gone. We believe you, we believe you just fine. But don't be thinking I'm easy fool though. Just because you only got half of what you should have, don't be thinking that away. The old man pulls his sweatshirt off over his head and crawls in closer under the dock to flash the dragonfly eyes at Lenny. Neck, ha neck hair sprouts sporadically over what appears to be a clerical collar. Lenny strains to focus. Where would an old geezer find a clerical collar? In a goodwill bin? A church shelter? Jesus, maybe he murdered a priest and stole the clothes right off the holy man's back. Lenny tries to, re to call his neurons to order. Just let this homeless murdering priest man or whoever he is find a way to release him from this aching muscle press, from this nothingness from, his, from the waist down then hopefully his legs will have enough time to wake up and run the rest of his aching body out of here. Surely he can outrun this scrap of rags. The priest man, muttering as if there were an audience between his own ears, hauls a semi-flat stone out of the muck. Lenny braces himself for a quick end, but instead of slamming the stone into Lenny's head, the geezer carefully folds his sweatshirt around the stone takes care to tidy up the edges. Then he sits back on his heels and seems to freeze into some kind of trance, eyes closed but moving rapidly beneath his lids. Eventually he whispers, amen, motherfucker, and lifts Lenny's head to ease the padded stone under Lenny's neck. The lake is still and quiet, and Lenny wonders what the old man is up to and if he's really trying to help how the priest man will react once the wakes start hitting. But mainly he's glad for the padding. He's glad for the relief a rock can give a boy's head. He's glad for the man's fingers firm in his hair and gripping his scalp. And when it comes down to it, and he doesn't want to get all dramatic about this, but still, he's glad for this one last dream, if that's what this is. The priest man runs his hands down toward Lenny's legs. And though Lenny can no longer feel his legs, he can glimpse the rapid weaving of the ancient fingers disappearing low, pulling high, nicking knuckles against the dock pilings just above his grizzly head, cursing, muttering as he, uh, excuse me, as he untangles Lenny's feet from the soggy netting. Two skinny legs, too, just sticking out from under a dock. The priest man's eyes flick up toward Lenny's head, then back out as he focuses on the net. They could have been cut off. Disembodied legs, praise the Lord Jesus. Jesus, they looked so. They did. They looked so. Lenny tries to imagine how he would look from the bank above, his legs lying tangled in the mud, how the old man might have felt spotting them. The thought gives him a twinge of guilt about the stump thing. Then we saw his face, we did, baby, baby face and breathing, live caught. The priest man has led Lenny's legs free from the netting now and is examining the post across Lenny's chest, dragonfly eyes flickering. He creaks to a stand and picks up the splintered plank he dropped into the muck. But he was dead. We saw that he was dead, dead. Lenny tries again to move his legs and an awakening pain shoots up to his knees, his thighs, or he thinks it does. Anything broke, broke down in there? It was a question he hadn't thought to ask yet. He'd skipped right over the broken bone thing, what with the breathing air thing being such an immediate issue. The priest man leans his plank against the dock. Goddamn resurrection is what we got up in here. Lenny hears the click of the old man's belt buckle and the slip of the belt being pulled through pants loops. 
a shirt brushing over it. The old guy drops back down to his knees in the mud, his bare mottled skin barely holding in his ribs, his belly thin over loose pants, sagging now for lack of a cinch. Slowly, painstakingly, he secures his shirt to the end of the plank with his belt. He takes hold of the board, begins to wedge the shirt in between Lenny's chest and the stuck dock post. The clerical shirt encasing the plank is practically zero defense against the wood digging into Lenny's chest. But Lenny is not gonna stop the old guy now. Do it, Lenny's own voice startles him, chiseled, a, a failed dry heave. A puzzled look takes hold of the geezer's face. His eyes wander for a moment like they might be in danger of rolling backwards for a view of the inside of his own brain. But then the dragonfly eyes recover and dart out across the water, only to follow the water right back to Lenny's chest where it is suddenly lapping. The old man cocks his head, hearing the same thing Lenny's hearing, the high-pitched saw of an outboard, large by the sound of it, signaling a grand wake. The priest man starts to hum, his fingers jittering a bead against his plank. Lenny wants to tell the old cracked brain not to worry, that he can take it, that the thought has arrived in his brain, <coughs> that the repercussions of the wake, now licking up into his chin, closing in on his mouth and nose, might just scare the priest man into a fit of strength that could finally, finally set him free. So Lenny tries his best to look even more desperate than he is. But that turns out not to be all that difficult because when the wake hits, it's a gusher washing completely over Lenny's head in a rush he was in no way prepared for. He chokes out muck as the water eases back. He gulps in air just, because the, just before the wake erupts again. Please, God, let the priest be real. The water rises and the old man wrenches the splintered plank in both arms, shoves it beneath the post that's trapped Lenny in the mud, carves his plank deep into Lenny's chest and throws his whole body on the downward side of the makeshift lever. Let a loose, you fungal infested load of oppression, the priest man yells, let a loose. His plank creaks, boasts what must be a breaking point. The rail thin geezer pulsating on his end, the load of oppression seemingly immobile on the other. But as the water builds speed toward the bank, the piling suddenly rocks along Lenny's chest, settles back, rocks again harder. The old man gives one last heave, but the plank snaps, knocking him face down into the rushing water. The log rolls right back into place, but the shift across the knot in Lenny's chest inspires him to dig into the muck with his good elbow and his stump and wrench his body just as the largest contingent of the wake washes back over him. Lenny holds his breath under the silty leg and working with the wave, twists hard to his side. The piling pops him in the head as it rolls free. Lenny pushes up on his good elbow, his back screaming. Lake Norman washes the foamy debris of its wimpy encore back up onto the shore. The dripping priest man turns and sits up in the water, panting, struggling for air. The thing about the priest man, he does not ask Lenny how he got stuck, stuck under that dock, nor how long he'd been wedged there, exposed and cold, nor even whether Lenny is okay. Instead, once he's breathing easier, once the lake has died down and they are sitting side by side in its calm shadows, shallows, bordering the big city of Charlotte, North Carolina, the city that had been Lenny's destination for the past week, but was still less than halfway to his quest. The old man turns to him and asks the one question Lenny will absolutely not answer. Where the hell are you from? Thank you. <laughs>